Hey guys. So first I want to thank everybody who's watched my videos and my lessons thus far. I hope that they have been helpful. Second, I want to give you a heads up that this lesson is going to be heavy and it's going to discuss some serious topics such as abuse and suicide. So if these are sensitive topics for you, please ensure that you have proper support. Now, before launching this channel, I have shared my life experiences through blogs and publications for nearly two decades. Life has presented me with numerous lessons. However, this lesson surpasses them all. Now, my primary motivation for resuming therapy after my ordeal with A was this need for assistance in reconciling two conflicting aspects of myself. During the process of recovery from a past relationship, I engaged in parts integration hypnotherapy, which facilitated a dialogue between these two opposing facets. During this time, my mind actually conjured two distinct images for each side, which I have AI generated so I could introduce you to them both. This is what charity stands for. The aspect that sees the best in others, clings to hope, makes sacrifices, believes in unconditional loves, longs for happy endings, and believes anything is possible. She's the lover. In contrast, the other side assesses probability, craves structures, views reality without embellishment, depends on facts and knowledge, and harbors skepticism about humanity's virtue due to experiencing my deepest wounds and yearning for just justice. She is a fighter that I call Athena. Now, these two were not always in conflict. They function as best friends for a very long time, propelling me through challenges without hesitation or doubt. The battle began when I suffered a mental breakdown from my ex. After years of emotional abuse and gaslighting, Charity could no longer trust herself and became suppressed. So Athena compensated to ensure my survival. Afterwards, they made a pact to never allow history to repeat itself. But guess what? It did. And now both sides are in turmoil, trying to figure out which one is to blame and who is meant to take the lead. Now, for those who have not viewed my previous lessons, allow me to provide a quick recap. For six years, I was in a relationship with a sociopath suffering intense psychological and emotional abuse that drove me to attempt suicide twice and lose my sense of self. It took over two years to rebuild my confidence to a point where I felt ready to put myself out there again, only to encounter an eerily similar situation with a man that I refer to as A that has brought all that past pain right to the forefront. Now, I thought I was done with A, as I stated in my initial lesson, but due to unresolved issues, triggers of complex PTSD, and perhaps destiny, it led me through another round of attempts to obtain closure. Despite my persistence to have him hold to a promise that he made and understand the truth, I unfortunately have not been successful. I was forced to face the cold hard facts that indeed history has repeated itself, which ended up being confirmed in this past year's solar return, which according to Pluto in my first house serves a greater purpose. This has placed me in a difficult position in turn, making this lesson more just about closure in relationships, but also about the pursuit of truth and justice while navigating the tension between personal beliefs and societal expectations. It involves understanding what it means to stand in your own power as opposed to exerting control over another or relinquishing it completely. In 1972, psychologist Jerome Kagan proposed the concept of cognitive closure, which was then further developed by social psychologist Ari Kruglansky, who defined it as individual's desire for a firm answer to a question and an aversion towards ambiguity, coining the phrase need for closure. Humans have historically understood the world through stories. The narrative approach is theorized to be one reason why Homo sapiens outlasted five other human species with whom we once shared the planet with. Our unique cognitive structure allows us to communicate stories from one generation to the next, building upon history and conceptualizing future innovations. The patterns in these stories enable us to learn from past mistakes, adapt to ensure our survival, and make better choices when faced with adversity. While stories provide us with a sense of security, research on cognitive closure suggests that individuals have a varying need for structure and certainty. Personalities who rely on structure and order exhibit a higher need for closure compared to those who are more adaptable and can go with the flow. However, the dynamics change when the situation or event carries emotional weight or holds something of value to us as our emotional and psychological healing process become more influential. Psychologically, cognitive closure is linked to the cognitive processes, including how we handle processing information and decision-making. It represents the mind's craving for completion and certainty. Emotional closure, on the other hand, relates more to our emotional and psychological healing processes influenced by experiences, relationships, and individual coping mechanisms to move forward and find peace with the past. Both types of closures can interact. For instance, achieving cognitive closure on an issue can sometimes facilitate emotional closure and vice versa. 
This interaction often occurs during tragic events that may not have a personal connection to individually for some, but a collective one, such as the 9-11, the Holocaust, or even January 6th attack on the Capitol. Now consider the emotional investment we put into a TV series and the uproar it causes when it's canceled or we don't get the ending as expected. People demand answers or resolution, forcing networks to bring back shows or create one-time spinoffs to conclude the event. It's amazing that we can demand closure from fictional stories, but when it comes to real life dramas, especially in unhealthy relationships, ghosting or unexpected one side breakups, we're expected to just accept things and move on. So when I hear that the only person that could give you closure is yourself, it's like nails down a chalkboard for me. Western culture's sense of self is so hypocritical that it's really not surprising that we fear the unknown so much. Now, in the U.S., we're split between the secure and insecure attachments. Secure, healthy relationships generally have mutual understanding of why they end and both parties' honest conversation to move on. Closure may not be needed in these cases. However, when you're dealing with sociopathic or narcissistic individuals, you're left wondering who the villain is because you've likely been gaslighted into thinking that it's you. No network is there to pick up the story, and it leaves you with this void of truth. You can assume or choose a narrative that makes you feel better, but you'll never know beyond a reasonable doubt if it's true. You can move on and accept that it's over, but it does not mean that you have closure. I mean, how can one know what to trust without truth? It kind of creates this void of uncertainty that builds up and with triggers that rips that bag wide open every time they're activated. Another common question when seeking closure or wanting to figure out who is the person that hurt you is that people will often say, why does it matter? If someone treated you badly, you should accept it. Move on and just know that you deserve better. You didn't lose anything. They did. They won't change and karma will prevail. They'll end up miserable, probably die early, and most likely alone. That is your justice. But you know what? If I care for somebody, I really don't want them to be punished. I want them to be reformed. But if they won't, that alternative is not justice to me. It's actually spreading a disease. You know, maybe I survived the infection, but what about the next person and the one after that? What if they have children and the trauma that they impact may inflict them? How is it any different than letting a patient zero of a pandemic run around spreading a virus that hurts or even kills others? Do I not have a moral obligation to warn others about someone, especially when I possess the knowledge to assess the condition? Now, I understand that most people don't think in context of the other, especially in the United States. And I know this is one of my unique traits, but I also know that most, if not all people, that have experienced a toxic relationship are often left in emotional distress and uncertainty that can have a lifelong effect on their well-being. Denying closure in these situations is also a power move by toxic individuals to control the narrative they created or to prevent the victim from sharing their secrets. And it works well, or they wouldn't use it. Because you must be willing to sit with humility and allow judgment to be passed from strangers to share the story, even after the person you trust to support you makes you question your reality. And trust me, when you're forced to relive it, you ask, what does that say about me, right? Like, how am I so traumatized that I can't protect myself against those who seek to hurt me, even when I know what to look for? How can I trust myself in the next relationship if I don't even know what happened in the previous one? Now, closure is crucial for developing secure attachments, regardless of the type or duration of the relationship. What matters is how the relationship impacted you and the value it held. Closure is important in friendships, family, and even in work relationships, but it's especially critical in intimate relationships to move on in a healthier way. Closure allows both individuals to express their feelings, ask questions, and understand why the connection ended. By providing emotional resolution, it can reduce rumination and negative thoughts, enabling individuals to move on more easily. It also, also offers valuable lessons and insights for future relationships. The need for closure increases as we age because the concept of settling down and the need for belonging becomes more important. Now, closure plays a significant role in emotional healing by helping individuals accept the thoughts and feelings associated with the particular event or relationship. Without closure, people can often feel stuck in emotional turmoil, which can negatively affect their physical and mental health. Now, a study from the Journal of Social and Personal Relationships showed a strong link between achieving closure and being happy in later relationships. Closure helps people let go of the old troubles and look forward to new opportunities with hope. In fact, another study found that 89% of individuals experienced successful emotional healing upon achieving closure, underscoring the efficacy and the relevance of closure in the context of emotional recovery. Closure helps you process tough emotions, encourages growth, reduces guilt, stops you from being stuck, teaches important lessons, boosts your self-esteem, and opens up to new possibilities. Closure can often lead to positive outcomes in other areas as well, such as career opportunities, thanks to this improved, resilient mindset.
Despite all the evidence to the importance of closure, some people still refuse to give it, especially in unhealthy relationships involving emotional and psychological abuse, which can cause the most damage. It allows one to avoid having to accept responsibility for any harm that they may have caused or because they don't really want you to move on. That is why it's so difficult to achieve closure with a narcissist and why a sociopath will never give you one unless there is some ulterior motive. Toxic behaviors lead to dysfunctional actions that create dysfunctional reactions, causing one to act out in unusual ways. The lack of closure, communication shutdowns, or abusive dynamics feed into inner turmoil and trigger these reactions as an attempt to make sense of the situation. This is especially true when it comes to emotional abuse, which is a pattern of behavior where one seeks to control, manipulate, or undermine another sense of self-worth and reality. Gaslighting, which is a specific form of emotional abuse, occurs when the person makes the victim question their own memories, perceptions, and sanity. They might deny events, accuse the victim of being too sensitive or crazy, or twist situations to make the victim feel like they're always in the wrong. Emotional abuse can be subtle and insidious, leaving no visuals, bruises, or scars, but the psychological effects can be just as damaging, if not more so. Studies consistently show that the victims of emotional abuse often struggle with mental health issues like depression, anxiety, low self-esteem, and PTSD. They might constantly second-guess themselves, feel isolated and hopeless, and have difficulties trusting others. It can be incredibly confusing and painful for the victim who might still question their own reality and wonder if they were even abused or if they were the problem as the abuser claimed. Without proper closure and validation, moving forward and healing can be challenging. This could lead to more attempts to talk, sending messages to find closure, or understanding due to the feelings of rejection, anger, fear of abandonment, and low self-esteem. Actions may include blowing up someone's phone with calls and texts, or more a serious attention-seeking behavior, such as threats to one livelihood, property destruction, and even physical harm. Meanwhile, the one triggering the behavior remains calm, showcasing just how crazy that other person appears. And this is why borderline personality disorder is often misdiagnosed, especially in cases where a trauma bond has developed. It's important to assess these situations without bias to see if one is acting in response to abuse or acting out as the abuser. The key to knowing is if there is a pattern. Unless that person acts the same way throughout their life with friends, coworkers, and in previous relationships, but refuses to acknowledge the problem, then yeah, they may be on the borderline spectrum. And there's been this theory that toxic personalities tend to lessen with age as one matures. They become more emotionally stable or emotionally mature as they grow out of the disorder. But studies have actually proven this theory wrong, showcasing that they stay the same or actually get worse with age. So if a person only acts dysfunctional with one person, then it's likely because that person is dysfunctional to them versus them actually having a disorder. This issue affects many people, but it's not always openly discussed. Even I feel uncomfortable at times sharing my stories. Like saying I was in a relationship with a sociopath or endured long-term psychological and emotional abuse leaves me feeling like people will view me as weak or I'm playing the victim. And part of this discomfort stems from the notion of the self being in control of every aspect of one life, gender stereotypes, and societal bias like, oh, sticks and stones rhyme to shame the victim for putting up with it. Spiritual gurus may state that you brought this upon yourself or that your story isn't true, which can even lead to more damage. This pushes down the trauma instead of confronting it, which often expresses through the body by ways of somatization. It can lead to depression and isolation with a sense of hopelessness. And so as this trend continues to rise, it is not surprising that so does the suicide rate, which continues to rise each year and actually hitting an all-time record high in 2023. Now, considering that I've experienced the full buffet of abuse throughout my life, I can say that gaslighting and emotional abuse has definitely been the most damaging. It just, it makes you feel physically violated, even though you can't find the bruises. And I guess the best way to describe this is to be blunt. And so this may be hard to hear. So fair warning. I would often beg my ex to just hit me when he was in these triggered states of emotional abuse. It would get so bad that sometimes I would actually stand in his way in hoping that he would just hit me. Because if I could feel the physical pain, then maybe that would convince my body to stop manifesting the emotional pain as physical. I mean, the pain would be so intense at times that the aftermath would make me feel like dirty and very shameful. It felt literally like I had been emotionally raped. Now our brains overlap in the way it processes emotional and physical pain. Both types of pain can activate similar regions in the brain, like the anterior insula and the anterior cingulate cortex, which are involved in emotional and cognitive processing. This is part of why emotional pain can feel physical. But this is also why support is crucial. 
Victims need to hear from others that what they experienced was real and that it's not their fault and that their feelings are valid. They might need professional help, like therapy, with someone who specializes in domestic violence or emotional abuse. They need a strong network of friends and loved ones who can listen without judgment and remind them of their worth. Now, if you're watching this and resonating with any of these experiences, please know that you are not alone. Emotional abuse is far more common than most people realize, and it's nothing to be ashamed of. You deserve to be treated with respect, love, and kindness, so reach out for help. There are people out there that are ready to support you. And if you suspect that someone you might know might be in an emotionally abusive relationship, don't hesitate to check in with them. Let them know that you're there to listen without judgment and encourage them that they seek help. Ultimately, breaking the cycle of emotional abuse and gaslighting takes all of us working together. We need to keep having these conversations, aware, raising awareness and supporting survivors. We need to hold people accountable for their actions and challenge societal norms and power dynamics that enable abuse, not just in intimate relationships, but also in the workplace, families, and even at the collective level. Now, this is where the lesson enters a complex phase. It is essential to a state that I do not endorse the concept of personality disorders as they are frequently misdiagnosed. The criteria established by the DSM are outdated, imprecise, and influenced by pharmaceutical companies. Professionals in various psychological disciplines have attempted to develop alternatives to the DSM. One such alternative, which I find credible, is the Psychodynamic Diagnostic Manual, second edition, or the PDM-2. The PDM-2 framework helps us understand healthy and troubled personalities. The goal is to improve how we diagnose and treat mental health problems. PDM-2 is rooted in psychoanalytical theory, the idea that our present is influenced by our past and supported by neuroscience and supported research on treatment. Furthermore, it includes ideas from the attachment theory, object relations theory, self-psychology, and more. The PDM explains that there is no hard difference between a personality type or style and a disorder. Everyone has a personality style. For instance, one can have a narcissistic style without having the full-blown disorder. When looking at a personality disorder, it's important to see if, if it causes the persons or others around them distress, lasts a long time, and is so deep into who they are that they can't even remember being any other way. It's important to tell the difference between personality and other issues like sy symptom syndromes, brain problems, or even psychotic disorders. It's also important to check to see if what is going on is actually a personality disorder is instead just a reaction to an ongoing stressful situation. And this is the most important piece of the book to what I was saying prior. Under sufficient strain or trauma, any of us can look borderline or even psychotic. Hence, it is not possible to diagnose a personality disorder without considering other possibilities that may explain the patient's behavior. Now, this is why there's been this movement to define these types of behaviors as traits instead of these disorders. These traits are known as the dark triad, which was coined in 2002 by researchers Deloitte Paulus and Kevin Williams. Now, these tra traits include narcissism, which is considered an inflated sense of self-importance and a deep need for admiration. They might belittle their, belittle their partners to feel superior. Machiavellianism, which is master manipulators willing to deceive and exploit others for their own gain. And psychopathy or sociopathy, individuals that lack empathy, moral, and remorse, allowing them to harm others without guilt. Now, it's called dark because they're associated with callous, manipulative, and self-serving behaviors that can cause serious harms to relationships or even society in general. Now, research has shown that although these traits are distinct, they often occur together. Individuals in high in one dark triad trait are more likely to also exhibit the others. The dark triad shares several features in how they manifest relationships. All three are associated with this kind of game playing love language, a lack of emotional investment or commitment, and with a tendency to choose partners that are based on superficial traits like physical attractiveness or those that showcase high levels of compassion or empathy. However, research has also shown that each of the dark triad traits might impact or play out in relationships differently. Machiavellianism can make relationships feel like a never-ending power struggle. Since Machiavellian individual is consistently assessing situations for personal gain, relationships are an area where emotional leverage is used to control others. This can break down trust and respect, making it always feel like there's a conflict or opposition. These relationships often lack emotional depth because actions are more about getting ahead than true love or affection. Partners of Machiavellian's people can feel like they need to be careful trying to figure out what the other person's motives is or what they might 
do next. It can lead to where one partner is always trying to be in charge, causing fights, hard feelings, and manipulations. Both might end up fighting for control all the time with no chance for the honesty and openness that you will find in a healthier, supportive relationship. Narcissism seems to be especially damaging in the long term as the initial charm gives way to entitlement and de devaluation. Recent studies have begun to look at different sides of narcissism, suggesting that narcissism is not just one thing, but rather has distinct aspects that may impact relationships in different ways. One key model puts narcissism into two main parts, narcissistic admiration and narcissistic rivalry. The admiration is linked with that charm, self-assurance, and that hunger for praise often called narcissistic supply. In relationship, it shows up as being very attentive and complimentary and first sweeping you off your feet. Now, the rivalry, on the other hand, is about opposing others and being defensive. It involves putting others down, being super sensitive to criticism, and becoming aggressive when their ego is challenged. In relationships, this leads to fights, manipulations, and the constant need to one-up or put down the partner to maintain the sense of superiority. Research shows that while narcissistic admiration may seem attractive at first, and even linked to some positive relationships outcomes in the short terms, it's the rivalry that damages the relationship over time. The ongoing criticism, controlling behaviors, and lack of empathy associated with it creates this pattern of idealization and then devaluation in narcissistic relationships. So while the admiration draws people in, it's actually the rivalry that keeps them stuck in the bad situation. The rivalry is also tied to negative long-term effects like less happiness in the relationship, more fights, and then even abuse. This difference is important because it explains why narcissists can seem great at first, but then they cause the relationship to fall apart. It's not the confidence or the grandiosity that is the issue, but actually the toxic behaviors and attitudes they use to defend their weak egos. Not every narcissist though will fit into this model, but it does help make sense of why people tend to stay in these types of relationships. Now that last trait, psychopathy or sociopathy is consistently destructive in relationships. Sociopaths can seem charming at first, but they tend to become emotionally abusive and manipulative. They tend to have volatile, unstable relationships marked by more conflict, aggression, and infidelity. There's often a complete lack of emotional connection or empathy for their partner's needs. Now, sociopathy is also seen as having these two parts. Factor one is about the lack of feelings and troubles connecting with others, while factor two is about being impulsive and its antisocial lifestyle. Both are problematic, but it's factor one that causes the most difficulties and dysfunction in relationships. Factor one's traits include charm, high self-regard, and of course, manipulation with this deep lack of empathy and emotional depth. They may appear nice and likable at first, but then their relationships tend to suffer from this emotional distance, cruelty, and using others for their own gain. The real harm in relationships comes from the absence of emotional empathy and the struggle to form close bonds. Partners often state feeling like there's a barrier between them and that, they, that their emotional needs aren't understood or met. Factor one struggles to give love and support needed for a good relationship. They might act kind or say nice things, but in the end, it doesn't feel true. Over time, this makes their partners feel lonely, not valued, and confused. And this, honestly, is exactly how I felt like with my ex. He would be so kind and so caring, and then suddenly just turn cold and harsh with like a flip of a switch. And for someone that's an empath like me, it was very unsettling. I mean, it literally felt like a body was missing a soul. Now, factor two is what flips that switch, in addition to the out-of-the-blue arguments, breakups, and cheating. But it's factors one's coldness, manipulation, and inability to empathize that breaks the trust and emotional safety that the relationships are built on. This is because factor one will not take responsibility for factor two's actions. Some research suggests that people with high factor one traits might deliberately seek out partners who are easy to manipulate and tolerate their emotional deficits usually ones that showcase high levels of empathy or may have been previously abused in a relationship or childhood. This could create this vicious cycle where the non-sociopathic partner consistently doubts themselves, lose confidence while depending on the sociopathic partner for validation. Now keep in mind, when talking about the lack of empathy within all these traits, it's referring to compassionate empathy. All types can still display cognitive empathy, meaning if somebody is highly intelligent and observant, they can know what someone is feeling. They just don't feel it themselves. And this is often has been referred to somebody as a dark empath, someone that possesses the traits of the dark triad and uses their ability to understand and manipulate the emotions of others for personal gain or to control the situation. 
Now, one last area of studies that came across in my research was that mixing these traits and how they play out in attachment styles. Since these are separate fields of psychology, it's not surprising that several studies found connections between sociopathic and narcissistic traits and insecure attachment. The difficulties trusting others and regulating emotions that contribute to attachment issues may also be what underlines these dark traits. This is why people associate that sociopathy or narcissistic traits with the avoidant attachment versus the anxious attachment that's associated with borderline and narcissistic, along with the correlation between the narcissist and the empath relationship or the avoidant and the anxious attachment relationship. All of it develops in childhood, but attachment is reflective to how secure a child feels with its caregiver, whereas the dark traits are a result of abuse or a traumatic event by the caregiver. Now, the drive to want to know whether or not your partner is an avoidant or a narcissist is usually motivated by this hope that they can change or convincing yourself like you're not the problem. And I 100% get that. But I will say that trying to figure out these different dynamics can lead to self-sacrificing your mental well-being to find that answer. I can stand in my own humility and say, use me as an example. I mean, I literally almost died when it came to my ex. And the journey with A has been extremely stressful. And it's bled into my ability to work and it affected my dogs. I will also state that if the motivation is around hoping that one will change because it's assumed that it avoided is more likely to change than a narcissist, it doesn't guarantee they will. Each classification does prove to be more difficult to motivate change, but there are outliers in every situation. It really does come down to the person's desire to want to change. And unfortunately, some people are just content living with a miserable life and it will take something bigger than you to motivate them to change. It doesn't mean that you're not worth the change. It just means that their fear is stronger than love. The difference between a narcissist or somebody who's an avoidant, a simple way to know is that an avoidant shouldn't be emotionally abusive. Use gaslighting tactics or have that hot and cold dynamic. Their behavior is consistent. So if they do, there isn't a difference. You simply just have an avoidant with the dark triad traits. If you think you're in a relationship with someone that possesses any of those traits that I mentioned, it is recommended that leaving and cutting contact is the next step. But I also know that's not easy, especially if you're a high empathic person or deep into spiritual practices. You might have tried to get them into therapy and look to spiritual beliefs, hoping to manifest change. So if you think that going to therapy with this person will be to the benefit, I'm going to highly recommend against that. If they agree to go with you, it is because they're looking to invalidate you further. They are going to be calm and collected and they're just going to sit there and they're going to lie and they're going to lie and lie, which is going to trigger you to become emotionally reactive because that is their intention. And the therapist is immediately going to judge you as borderline or unstable. The true problem is that probably 90% of therapists out there are not skilled to manage people with these kinds of traits. There hasn't been a 100% effective method that's proven results. And some will even refuse to take on clients because they know they aren't equipped to handle it. But if for some reason you do convince them to go and the therapist picks up on the truth of the issue, they will immediately stop going. They may even go into this honeymoon phase with you thinking like you're no longer needed to go to therapy because that one session cured them. Now, if you think getting your partner to see a therapist on their own means that they're not a narcissist or a sociopath, that's also not true. There's this misconception that these people won't seek therapy, but they can. They won't stick it they won't stick with it or be honest with the therapist. They'll give enough information to showcase while they're there so they can get validation that you're the problem or learn how to manipulate their next victim even more. But as for yourself, you should absolutely be going to therapy. You should be going by yourself so you can become stronger and learn what is really going on in your relationship. Because remember I said, knowledge is power. Now, before I jump into the personal side of this lesson with A and my evaluation on him, I want to point out some considerations before you make your own personal judgments, either on him, me, or in your situation yourself, especially around cognitive bias. My first lesson focused on not hastily judging others that may possess harmful traits due to the complexity around human behavior. This is important to avoid what is called availability bias. We tend to take our most recent memories or information we can recall and use it to form our opinions and attitudes. It is suggested that our brains had to deal with a significant amount of uncertainty back in the primal years, so we had to remember the most important things that kept us alive. To do that, our brains sent that less important information into the background or we forgot it altogether. Now, you can think about this as like archiving old files on a computer or your most recent opens when you load a program. So if you've been scrolling all day on social media or been watching videos on narcissism or attachment theory and you hear something that is relatable, and then you will automatically draw the conclusion based on the information instead of reflecting back. If one is looking to prove if someone is innocent or guilty, you can find the evidence to support it either way. 
That's why some people do not believe in scientific research or studies because it's often stated there's a study for anything you need, you need, you can find the evidence for. Now, as much as that's probably true, a person must factor in the conditions around the study, meaning population size, methods used to obtain the information, statistic, statistical outcomes, and if it's been replicated. There is such thing as scientific bias, which is when someone will test a hypothesis over and over again to achieve the results desired without mentioning the failing results. Now, what people remember about an experience or a situation is influenced by their expectations and emotions. The peak end rule is what causes you to judge a situation based on how you felt at the most intense moments, the peaks, good and bad, as well as how it ended or the last interaction instead of basing it on the overall situation. This is why in breakups, you tend to remember the fights or the bad times because it's the most recent experience that relates to those bad peaks. But after a day or two, you might start to miss them and become nostalgic thinking about the good times and remembering how you felt good while forgetting the bad. The next consideration before judgment is asking yourself what is truly driving your motivation. Is it a logical conclusion or is it one solely based in belief? Now, if it's only based in belief, that's okay. But then you must ask yourself, is the belief then logical? There is a concept called dual process thinking. Essentially, the idea is that you have two different but parallel types of thinking, hence what you've witnessed between my two conflicting sides. And it's concepted that the intuitive side or my charity side is that fast, automatic and trial and error, error processing. Belief bias can be formed to keep you thinking and moving quickly from event to event. Then the other thinking process or my Athena side is slow, deliberate and logical. And this is a skill that is actually learned. We are not innately based in logic, but in instinct. It would seem logical though, that if we aren't skilled at managing these two sides, this would drive us to overthink if we feel that the outcome is important or is uncertain. Take the motivation behind my ex, for example, right? My motivation was to find out what was wrong with him in hopes that I could fix it. I truly believe that if I gave him enough information and evidence to showcase the harm he was causing, that it would he would see the errors in his ways, drive change, and we could start things over and work things out. Now, this is due to my belief that ignorance drives harm. This belief goes all the way back to the Greece and Socrates. He believed that ignorance was the root of all evil or wrongdoing. This perspective suggests that anyone is capable of change if they acquire the necessary knowledge and understanding what it means to be good. However, this belief is based in cognitive intelligence and does not factor in emotional intelligence. Trauma and fear are not triggered by this slow, deliberate thought processing. It's instinct based on survival's needs driven by our emotions. This is why when you're dealing with someone on the high end of the spectrum, evidence or knowledge will not motivate them because they believe that they are smarter than you no matter what you say. And they lack the emotional depth or empathy associated with that knowledge. In addition, our motivation to act or change is usually based in emotion, not information. The information may seem interesting, but if it doesn't hold any value, it's not going to trigger an emotional response. And that is one of the strongest indications of a sociopath. So once I realized that my evidence wasn't working with my ex, I was then motivated by the belief that it must be because it was just coming from me and he was convinced he was smarter than me. So I needed to get validation and support. I believe if I got proof, others would see the truth, join me in the fight instead of thinking I was crazy and help me help him get better. Because one key trait with sociopaths is exploitation. They will spread lies and exploit their victims to make them feel defenseless. They succeed by surrounding themselves with people that either possess the same traits or ones that they have emotionally manipulated to always believe them no matter what. Now, these types of people are called flying monkeys, named after the monkeys that supported the Wicked Witch and the Wizard of Oz. So even with the proof that I did end up getting, people still made excuses for him and refused to acknowledge the damage that he had done. So yeah, in the end, psychology, I was fulfilled with that cognitive need for closure, but in a way it worsened the situation because it disproved my belief that anyone could change. And I was left without emotional closure, driving the belief that I wasn't worth the change as he often stated. And what did that mean about who he is as a person? I mean, how could someone say they love you only to turn around and literally wish for you to succeed in killing yourself? Like, did I seriously just spend six years of my life dancing with the devil? Which leads me to my third consideration before judgment. Stigmas, negativity bias, and emotional contagion. It is known that the more you explore and expose yourself to the dark side of human nature, you run the risk of becoming your dark yourself in various ways. You can feel emotionally dark. So you have, take, you have to take in consideration that if you're feeling disdain, compassion fatigue, or even like sociopathic yourself, is it because of the person themselves or the psychological, philosophical, and theological stigma around good versus evil surrounding it? 
I mean, it's easy to do that considering that Christianity holds a dominance in religion and still this concept in their practice, right? So someone that's good dies and goes to heaven. Someone that's bad is evil and they go to hell for eternity. And take the labels around the mental health conditions, right? Like I said, I mean, they call them the dark triad. It's not called the light triad. So and the problem is that stigmas are like weeds that eventually overtake the garden of optimism. So we just soon stop cultivating it and leaving all that's good to die. Trust me, like read the first chapter of the, the sociopath next door and you'll understand. And it makes sense. Like I empathize with Martha Stout to be one of the few psychologists that have the knowledge and experience to help victims recover and listen to their pain and struggles year after year. It is normal to view the triad as demons or sociopaths as the devil themselves. I mean, this is the main reason I didn't pursue my PhD in forensic psychology. I read numerous warnings that working with the psychopathic and criminal minds, such as serial killers, often drives one to become a criminal themselves or go literally insane. But there are outliers in mental health that are easily overlooked depending on the nature of one's crime or violation they conducted. And these, there are some that are trying to change these stigmas, especially those in humanistic psychology that believes that human are, humans are innately good. And if they've strayed from the path, we can bring them back, showcasing their good side instead of pushing the bad. Now, I do believe a lot of people's behaviors and negative mindset can change if they are aware of, if they are aware of it, giving them the tools to instigate change along with compassion and empathy for those on the middle to low end of the spectrum. Though the problem with this though, is that those on the higher end of the spectrum, empathy and kindness doesn't work. It only makes it worse for the person trying to help. And that has been in my own experience as well. So for those that are on that high end, we're back to square one. So you know what, fuck it. Just ignore the problem and hopes it goes away because that's the view of psychology lately, focusing so much on preventing the dry, dark triad in children instead of worrying about the dark adults who are simply unredeemable. The more, the more darkness bleeds into our leaders and society, it will soon lead to a destruction that we may not survive, such as nuclear war, another pandemic, or simply overdeveloping this planet so much that there isn't any land left to feed the overpopulation. So perhaps we need a different approach by facing the problem head on. And it's not that there isn't a way to help change these aspects. We just haven't found the right way to motivate. And this is why I conduct personal experiments on those I interact with by observing patterns of behaviors, listening to everything that is said and not said, and that of which I've learned in hopes of discovering that one secret thing that drives people to hurt others and if, if there is a way to stop it. And please understand the things that I'm sharing, I am not recommending you do anything of what I do for yourself. Remember, I mean, let me emphasize, I did almost die. You have no idea what someone without a moral conscious is really capable of. They will find your weaknesses and fears and they will exploit them. This is why those that are willing to treat these conditions to do so must almost act sociopathic when dealing with them. Since a sociopath's motivation revolves primarily around the desire for power, control, or sense of superiority, you must become an authority over them. You must always convey a powerful presence, be the void of any emotional response, and fearless. You have to motivate them by what they are motivated by, fear. A fear that they don't, if they do not change, they may lose what they value most. However, you must also know exactly what it is that they do value. And it's not easy when you don't even know the person you are dealing with. Now, again, I'm going to say this so strongly, you guys, these lessons are not meant to guide you to do as I do, especially in toxic relationships. I am not saying I am better than anyone else to put up with it because I'm not clearly, right? Since I can't even seem to recognize the signs, even with all the knowledge, but this is my key point. I do have the knowledge. And like I said, even though I'm not a doctor or a therapist, I don't make assumptions simply based off of my astrological makeup. I started taking college level psychology courses in high school and I have not stopped. I have taken abnormal psychology 101 and 301 around six times. And it's not because I failed it, but because I want to take it from a different perspective of professors and schools to gain the knowledge I need and keep myself up to date on the science. I have also taken numerous courses in developmental and social psychology. And while some people are busy reading fiction or listening to music, I'm reading or listening some nonfiction book or a 10 hour lecture on human behavior, neuroscience or genetics. But I just, I can't do it full time because it hardens me. It changes my idealism to pessimism. And this is why I need that human design and astrology aspect to center me back. All right, so I feel the best way to share this story is to take you on a journey into how my brain works. And I apologize, it can be really scary in there. But it will allow for full transparency in my actions, intentions, and understanding of my full, final conclusion. So we're gonna start with the prosecution. Little Miss Athena here. 
my logical and psychological side that will clearly state beyond a shadow of a doubt that A is on the moderate spectrum of sociopathy with high levels of narcissism, indicating that there's a possibility for change, but unlikely. Now, the defense claims that we're dealing with a deep, complex, free state influenced by third parties, low self-worth, negativity bias, backed by fate to drive transformation as proven with deep in astrological insights. Now, I'm not going to recap everything, but I will include some things that I purposely left out in the first video. I can admit that I was protective of him in the first video because a part of me hoped that he would watch it and be motivated to reach out after face with the truth. Well, guess what? He watched it and nothing changed. In fact, I think that things have actually gotten worse. And it's been a struggle to decide how much I should reveal as I was predetermined to expose him as much as I could without exposing his name to prevent him from hurting anyone else. I mean, I told him I was going to, but I have come to the realization that Navigating the line between protecting others and respecting privacy can be a bias within itself due to something called moral licensing. So I've decided to only share what is relevant to the arguments. All right, so what's happened since that first lesson? Well, while we were seeing each other, I had started researching his family tree and I got a notification that my membership was expiring. So I reached out asking if you wanted the tree I worked on and he re responded, acknowledging the work that I had put into it and ended the message with, hope you're doing well which ignited that all that I had moved past right back up because I knew he had watched the video. He knew I wasn't doing well, but he assumed I was over it since in the lesson I appeared as such. And it had been a few weeks since I had spoken to him. Now, this is his pattern, according to one of the girls that he dated for seven years. She specifically says he disappears for months until things settle down and then comes back acting like nothing happened. And when I got that email, I could have pretended it was over, but I knew that if I did, I would be enabling a pattern. And my goal was not to fall back into the trap. And I knew it was a trap because remember, he used that line, hope you're doing well, when he opened up that reconnection we had at that two month point, which led me back to asking for closure and testing who he really was. Now, from this part on, this was my motivation behind every email and action I took. I will not apologize for reaching out to him. And yes, I have sent multiple emails since that first lesson posted, each with the intention to test if I was dealing with a sociopath or not, providing him with the knowledge to change also while working on my triggers. And honestly, like he can't even be mad about the test because he told me he consistently tests the girls that he dates. So he should respect it if he claims to be who the person that he says he is, right? So it begins my investigation. Again, do not do as I do. I am not encouraging anybody for this. I'm giving this for insight only, right? Step one, I pulled a horary chart trying to figure out how he felt about me. Now, Horary astrology is a new practice I've been learning that pulls a birth chart to a question you desire to know or to find a last object, which asking how someone feels about you is actually a really common question when it comes to this. Now, when asking about another person in regards to someone that you have or had a relationship with, you look to the ruler of the seventh house and the sun, because that represents the male co-significator. Venus represents the female. Now, in this case, the sun was sitting in the seventh house, but in fall, indicating he either hated me or hated himself for what happened with the relationship. My instinct was that because he was sitting in the eighth house, though, which represents mental anguish and fear, is that he was dealing with very complex and emotional or psychological issues. He was also in a mute sign, which showed why he was not communicating with me. The interpretation showcased that he was kind of refusing to speak to me because he thought he was bad for me or not good enough for me, like he didn't deserve me. So I emailed him and asked him, but I got nothing back. Now, this is where this internal battle starts picking apart all that could be true and what was a lie. Because a sociopath lies a lot, yet they will claim to be honest. And they justify this by purposely leaving out pertinent facts so they can claim, I didn't lie, I just didn't tell you. A did this when it came to his previous relationship. At first, he said it was 10 years, and then it was 10 years on and off with the last three years being serious. He often boasted about how secure the relationship was, but he failed to mention that it was long distance at first and that they only saw each other once a month. Now, this pattern would have been an immediate red flag for me because of his other relationships not being as long either, as well as the one that he claimed was borderline. It fits the profile of not establishing long-term commitment or purposely picking women who either are emotionally vulnerable or long distance to avoid having to establish that emotional connection. But remember, he said he had admitted that he had a commitment phobia and he realized his issues through the long distance relationship ending. What had happened was that she wanted to get married, which resulted in an ultimatum to him. He failed to follow through, so she asked for space at the end, and when time was up, she had already started dating somebody else. Now, this was the first time someone had left him, and this hit him so hard that it drove him into therapy, not with just one therapist, but two, hoping to learn all he could about what it was that drove him to not follow through, which honestly is the common reason for a narcissist, if they will, go seek therapy due to some kind of 
break in a relationship. Now, after some time of intensive therapy, he went back to her and he explained that he had changed and what he had learned, but it was too late. She had already moved on. Yet, he failed to mention that he was unfaithful to her the entire time. And I only found that out after I discovered that forum I messaged, mentioned in my first lesson. When I confronted him about it, he claimed that, that he was never dating the girl and that they were just friends. Then he finally admitted to me, well, they engaged in sexual activity. They just didn't engage in sex, according to him, even though she stated on the forum that they had. And I explained to him, you know, this is still cheating. It doesn't matter if you had sex with the woman or not, you're still cheating. And he argued that it wasn't because it wasn't that he wanted anything to do with this woman. He was just lonely at times and liked having her around and she was fun or good to talk to. Now, I understand that this is a clear indication of somebody that is very sociopathic. So now I asked him like, okay, well, if your girlfriend was doing the same, would you be okay with it? And of course he said no. And then of course he had to kind of reflect on that for a minute. And then I said, well, have you told your therapist that you were unfaithful to her? And he said, no. So right there, I have two classic evidence of the sociopath going to therapy, but not fully realizing or taking accountability for their actions. However, at the time I wasn't judging him for it, right? Because at that point we weren't long distance and we were spending time together. And I was trying to help him understand that his behavior was wrong and taking accountability for it was important to realize that perhaps their relationship wasn't as wonderful as he claimed. However, it was that moment when everything kind of changed and things started going downhill because now I knew this as well and he couldn't use it as leverage. Now, when we had that first challenge, he had said to me, I'm sorry, you are so upset. Now I explained to him, one way you can tell if someone's a narcissist is how they apologize. A narcissist is never gonna say, I'm sorry. They're going to say, I'm sorry you feel that way. I'm sorry this upset you. It's never, I am sorry I did this to you, right? So when we reconnected after we had that break and that second challenge, he had said, I am sorry for my actions. And that's why I decided to continue things with him because he had sincerely taken responsibility. Now, I think that when we became exclusive, he stopped going to therapy. And after I confronted him about the infidelity, he never went back to his therapist as far as I know. So it's not surprising to me that he kind of backtracked. He fell back into this pattern of abuse and not taking accountability because no one's holding him accountable. Either that, or he wasn't sincere at any point and he just learned a new way to manipulate the situation. Another aspect of this is that he was very adamant about fighting for relationships. He said that it was very upsetting to him that his ex just walked away. It was like the first time they supposedly had this big challenge, which I highly doubt, but she left instead of fighting for it. So I said to him like, well, I do. I mean, I'm a fighter, man. Like if, if I care about something, I'm going to fight for them. I'm going to come at it from every angle. So as I was reflecting on everything, I started feeling really uneasy and, unwor and worried that I really did get myself involved with another sociopath. So I decided, you know what, another way to test this is just to be upfront with him, right? Like I thought, maybe this is not me. Maybe it's because I haven't directly told them what closure really means to me. And if I just asked the questions I needed answered, then this was my second test to see if he would tr hold true to his word on who he claimed to be. Now, when I said, when it comes to a sociopath, the only way to motivate them to change or to get them to do something is to threaten what they value. By no means, I'm encouraging anybody to do this because you're walking a very thin line. But I don't look at it as threatening him because the, the word threat is about inflicting harm on somebody, which is not what I was doing. I'm looking at it as trying to figure out who he is and what was true and what was not, and then finding some motivation to get him to be better and not to do this again to myself or other people. Now, A made it seem that having some emotional connection was really important to him. And he valued me. So if that was true, asking me for closure means I'm moving on. That should instill some motivation to want to change in order not to lose me. Or it was a manipulation to get me to be op emotionally open and vulnerable to control me because that's what a sociopath will do. So I told him, I need you to reach inside whatever soul you have to find a little bit of empathy, empathy so I don't need to go on an investigation for the truth. I explained that the silence was the cruelest thing that he had done to me. And I would rather know the truth, even if it hurts. But if he refused to give me an answer, then I was going to reach out to his exes and I gave him a deadline of five days. Now, I'm aware of the fact that if he is a sociopath, I'm potentially putting myself in a reactive state because if A responds with gaslighting and manipulation, it could trigger me and throw my self-worth into question. But I prepared myself for this. Now, I understand that some people may not approve of this method and say that it's not okay and that's fine. You're entitled to your opinion. But when I said when dealing with sociopaths, if this is who he is, maybe it's not worth the hassle to you, but to me, it's important. The point was that if he responded and was truthful, then I would know that he was most likely been in some kind of freeze stage and that he'd been going to therapy and working on himself. And that would have given me some peace. Then I would know that he's not sociopathic, history didn't repeat itself, and I wasn't made a fool of. If he responded with lies and manipulation, then I would know he is indeed a sociopath and I was wrong about him. Now, stating I was going to reach out to his exes, my intention had nothing to do with retribution to him or to cause him harm or pain. It was to find out the truth to stop harm from being done. I mean, honestly, like what's the difference between that and reaching out to previous employers? I mean, I wouldn't care if he reached out to my exes. 
I mean, most of mine have all tried to reconcile at some point anyways. And as for my lack sex, I could, he could say whatever he wants about me, but guess what? I have a psychological evaluation proving who he is. Not to mention, I also have a signed contract stating our relationship ended due to his abuse. And I also stated this specifically because I wanted to see if this is something that he valued, right? Because he said that his exes would never have anything bad to say about him. He is an excellent boyfriend. So if he valued that perception of himself, it would motivate him to change his behavior and respond in order to avoid hearing something different. And the point of the questions though, was something that I mentioned prior, which is that Socrates believed that people behaved badly because they weren't realizing the truth or didn't have the knowledge to be good. Now, one way he did this was through what is called the Socratic method which is when you engage in dialogue, asking a series of questions to review the contradictions in others' thoughts. When they can witness the contradictions, it is meant to guide them towards deeper truths. Well, guess what? A did respond to my questions, but his response sadly only proved to me that he was more sociopathic than I realized. It was so disturbing the fact that I asked AI to review it to make sure I wasn't being biased due to triggers, which AI stated that it showcased manipulation, gaslighting, minimizing the relationship, a lack of empathy and inconsistency. It stated the sender seems to be trying to shift the blame onto the recipient. This could be an attempt to avoid taking responsibility for their own actions and decisions. Now allow me to break this down so you can see what gaslighting and signs of narcissism or, and sociopathy looks like in a real example. First off, his first statement was, I am sorry, this is so hard for you which he repeated at the end as well, using an exclamation point. Now this is crazy to me because I thought he had learned what this meant. As I mentioned this prior, this is how a narcissist will apologize. He, he's stating, I'm, he's not saying, I'm sorry that I hurt you. I'm sorry for my actions and recognizing this has been hard on you. It's just, I am sorry, this is hard for you. So right there, I mean, I really honestly don't have to go further, but I will. Now, next thing he says, I think the main reason why I don't want to continue dating was because I don't think we're a long-term match. Your temper and outbursts when you texted me were very intense and inappropriate, and I didn't appreciate the name calling, etc. I felt your messages were manipulative and overall not emotionally healthy. I want someone that is emotionally stable and doesn't continue to give countless ultimatums or threats. If I don't reply or don't do something you want me to do, then you're going to do X, Y, Z, etc. This whole paragraph is like the epitome of gaslighting. First, Stating that he thinks that we're not a long-term match is countering and denying the fact that he claimed the opposite the entire time we were dating by stating how lucky he was and how I met all of his check marks. Next, he's shifting the blame onto me, suggesting that things ended due to my temper and outbursts and manipulative messages were reason, completely dismissing the fact of why I acted that way to avoid taking responsibility for his own actions or decisions, right? And remember, I know he watched that first lesson, which explained this from a psychological perspective. Then stating that I'm emotionally unhealthy and he wants more emotional stability, he's attempting to make me question my own perceptions and feelings by discrediting and diverting the focus on me instead of his own unhealthy and emotionally destabilizing actions. In addition, he's showcasing cognitive distortion by overgeneralizing, by stating I give countless ultimatums or threats if he doesn't reply. Yet this is the first time I've given him an ultimatum or as he called it, a threat. Just as he said, that's because a sociopath is always going to look at things as a threat. They are incapable of seeing it any other way. Now, he kept stating that we were incompatible through all the questions, like things like, I don't have to do these things because we were never dating, we were never exclusive, or we were never serious. Again, that's him gaslighting by minimizing our relationship and denying the fact that we were ever exclusive instead of just saying we were basically nothing. Like you were just some random girl I dated and I didn't think we were compatible, so I ended it. Now, I'm not going to list all the questions simply due to time, but to point out a few, I did ask him straight up, like, are you a sociopath? Now, there was a specific reason why I asked this because I wanted to see how much self-awareness he had, which was none. Because he wrote, seriously, no, I have empathy. That's why I'm replying back to you. Not because I'm under some sort of obligation to do so, but because I'm giving you closure because he put closure in quotes i pointed out in the email when i wrote to him i said if you have empathy you will respond back to me so he's only taking what i stated and giving it back right like he shouldn't have to say it empathy is shown not stated and he said that he's not under some sort of obligation to do so yet in his intro paragraph he says i was giving him an ultimatum because he's not replying so he is saying that he did in fact feel obligated and then putting closure in quotes he's basically mocking my need for closure sorry condescending and empathy do not go hand in hand now, I also asked him, do you want me to stop caring and move on? He wrote back, yes, I do, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. I want you to be happy, exclamation point. I want you to find someone that you were compatible with, with four exclamation points. Now, all he had to do was say, yes, I do. I want you to be happy, but no. He had, it, had to add in that he wanted me to find somebody that I'm compatible with, right? With those four exclamation points. Reiterating the fact that I'm not good enough for him. It's patronizing like a backhanded compliment. On the surface, it seems that he... Is expressing care and concern for my happiness and well-being 
but excessive use of exclamation points is disingenuous and dismissive. This also contradicts his previous view on not liking people that move on so quickly, but me doing so would absolve him of any responsibility or guilt for the pain that he caused. Now, this is probably the most disturbing response that I got out of all of them, which is, I asked him, is this what you wanted to happen? And this was his response. No, this isn't what I wanted to happen, but when I'm dating people, I don't expect things to work out. Approximately 70 to 90% of relationships don't make it past the year. And dating has an even, even higher failure rate as the vast majority don't even become exclusive boyfriend and girlfriend relationship. So expectations of dating becoming a serious relationship are low. Now this upset me so much because at no point did he ever say this to me that his expectations of dating were low. If I would have known this, I wouldn't have dated him at all. It showcases a pessimistic and negative bias against relationships, not someone who is self-aware and looking for a life partner as it's stated on his dating profile. In addition, it's illogical. When I would talk to him about certain things or if I would point out maybe methods of his behavior that were a little concerning, he would be like, well, I have to read the study. Well, when I learn something, I really want to make sure it's truthful and it's based in scientific facts, not something that's just assumed. I need to understand and see the studies. So the fact that he mentioned the 90% was surprising to me because he purposely took it out of context. That 90% is in relationships under 30, which is what I mentioned in my second lesson about how that's pretty normal, right? So as for that 70%, though, it's not due to like compatibility. It's due to the lack of, lack of authenticity and manipulation due to an insecure relationship or attachment. Honestly, though, it's very ignorant to base your relationship on how it will turn out due to a statistic that is consistently changing due to societal attitudes. I mean, if statistics were meant as an outcome, well, then some studies suggest that children could inherit narcissism from their parents in more than 50% of cases. And since he has a narcissistic father, then right there, that must mean he's a narcissist. Or another one says that 96% of antisocial behavior in children is heritable. And his father may even be at that level as well. So I guess, well, there you go. He's a sociopath because the statistics say so. And as I thought about this, of course, it was very triggering to me and upsetting. But I also know that if I reacted in a negative manner, it would only give him solidification in his irrational statements. I responded back with a contradicting debate. I said, okay, if this is true, then why A, B, C, D? I, and you know what? I'm going to give you another chance. I'm still going to give you until, you until those five days. If not, I'm still going to reach out to your exes. Because I was also trying to figure out at this point, like, why did he respond? What did motivate him to do it when before it wouldn't work? I believe that the only reason he responded back because he was trying to deny the fact that he was sociopathic. He didn't want to come to that conclusion because that is something that he truly feared. Now, this is something completely based on my own theories. And I have not come across this in any psychological studies. And I don't know if anybody's even looked into this. But in my experiences with myself and my friends, men that are being more narcissistic have issues with their mother. Men that seem to be more sociopathic tend to have issues with their father. And, I, and honestly, I don't know why. I don't know if it's because in a way mothers tend to be more doting or you know, there's some contradiction of that, but narcissism, you know, does have some empathy. Now on our first date, A made it clear to me that his father was a narcissist and that it was one of his biggest fears to become like him. So that's why he claimed to be very conscious of how he behaves. So again, like that showcased self-awareness, but now in the end, he's just showcasing that fear to be true. And I have a hard time understanding this. Like this is where my empathy tends to turn off. Like how does that not motivate you within itself? Becoming the person that hurt you so bad but you know what? This will be reflected in the defense, okay? Have not heard from him since my last response. I imagine it was very destabilizing to hear my response back to him because as I mentioned, he claimed to be this person based in logic. Yet his email was so illogical and irrational, which was really interesting to me because if he was somebody that has this complex PTSD, that means he wrote back in a triggered state. But I'm really not quite sure what triggered it. So this only proves to me more that the motivation for his response was to prove that he was not sociopathic. His way to say, well, I responded, so I gave her what she wanted, and now he can justify his actions, despite the fact that it was set in an extremely emotionally abusive and gaslighting language. So I thought that maybe he might have valued his reputation because that for my ex was his biggest motivation. Like the, my ex would rather have me die than exposed, be ever exposed as this bad guy. And I thought, well, okay, if he is really concerned about that, does he care what other people think? We do know that he doesn't value me. He doesn't value the connection we have. He doesn't value emotions or what he claimed he wanted. But then I realized his reputation also has nothing to do with this because he didn't respond back as I reiterated the fact that I was still going to reach out to his exes that did nothing. But besides that, I did say to him, you do realize that if you do not respond to me, this proves that you're a sociopath. And I will be showcasing this in my closure video. I will be sharing everything about you. I even said, I will tell them everything about who you are. Now, this was me stating like, I'm going to reveal your job, right? Like I'm going to tell people what to do. And this would expose him to his coworkers or superiors. And I really did have that intention because it also provides evidence to the case. Because when it comes to sociopaths, they tend to find careers that put them in positions of power or where they can be in control over another person. 
That's why CEO is the number one choice, but the rest are a therapist, psychologist, police officer, politician, surgeon, or some kind of other health profession, because not only are they in a power position, but they're needed. And at times they can play God with people's lives. And that's why those kinds of jobs come with a moral obligation. Now, my ex was in the health profession, which of course requires an oath to do no harm. Something I would usually say to or ask my ex is like, how do you consciously harm me knowing that you've taken an oath to do no harm? And his response was, well, the oath is to patients. It doesn't count for personal situations, which of course is not true. The oath literally talks about everybody. And when you see somebody acting immorally or something that goes against an oath that you take as a profession, make one wonder, did you choose this job because you believed in the purpose behind it or choose the job because you wanted to be in that position of power? It's a really kind of scary thought to know someone that is required to act morally lacks a moral conscience. Now, as for A, I've decided I'm not going to share what he does, other than the fact that he is in one of those morally responsible jobs. The reason why is not to protect him, but because I still have the defense to state on this. And I believe that he's good at his job, even if he does lack moral integrity. But honestly, and it doesn't really matter because he's not widely likened by his coworkers. I know this for a fact because randomly, I have a friend that knows people he works with and have asked about him. The reaction was not kind. So, in one last attempt, of me trying to get through and wanting to help Abe before I did anything, this video or completely disconnected or lost any empathy, I actually had to be in his neighborhood for a reason. So I thought, okay, well, I'm already here. I'm going to try to see if maybe he'll just meet me. Because one thing about this is that if he is truly sociopathic, why won't he face me? Like, why can't he say it to my face? My ex didn't have a problem doing that. I mean, if he truly means what he says, he would. He wouldn't care about seeing me hurt. It would actually make him feel more powerful. His excuse stating that he doesn't feel because we were just dating is weak and illogical, as I've already mentioned. And I realize like this is kind of skewing towards the defense, but this also is lined up with reputation or valuing how people perceive him. Now, because I am blocked, I had my best friend reach out to him about the meeting, stating that, hey, Cherry's going to be outside your place at this time. Can you just meet with her? Give her what she needs, and then she can just move on, right? Because I thought if a third party's involved, it should motivate him to more due to social likability bias. And this was a tested level of empathy as he claimed to have, but of course, he did not meet me. Now, I was very heartbroken about this, which I know seems a little ridiculous. Like, why would I expect him to meet me, right? Well, according to horror astrology, if he would have, it would have caused this great transformation. It was like at this moment, like that he didn't, it, it was time for me to accept that he's incapable of change and everything was a lie. Now, I did send him another message after this. Not right away. I waited. I didn't do the same thing I did last time. But it was the one last email regarding his solar return because I thought, okay, well, if his motivation is not his exes, not his reputation, not his job, what else is it? And I thought maybe if he realizes that him not changing could bring in a very catastrophizing year for him, that maybe that would motivate him. Maybe that will get him to change because his solar return is basically about that. It's this choice that he's either to take the lessons from the universe that it's been giving him through me and become a better person, or the universe is going to do something to make sure he has to change. I mean, his chart is so potent for this birth year with some really rare aspects. So of course though, nothing. And whether it's true or not, whether that manifests to be true, it's relevant. I mean, I guess looking at my own solar chart, which I'm gonna go through in a minute, it's pretty clear, like, I don't know, pretty been on point for me, but we'll see. Now, the last few notes to mention in the case for the prosecution uh, is to say that I did not reach out to his exes because as I mentioned in lesson two, I did reach out to his best friend. And he specifically called A's exes scorned women that would only have biased things to say. Now, this was enough confirmation to know that A most likely treated them the same way that he treated me. And I didn't want to bring up any past hurt for them. They're all in new relationships and I don't, they don't need to be reminded of a toxic one. As I said, sociopaths tend to surround themselves around people that are going to give them the thumbs up on their behavior or sociopathic themselves, right? Which is very clear to me that A's friend is that. But in this situation, which also may be swaying towards the defense, I believe that A is the flying monkey and his friend is actually the wicked witch. And I understand I could be biased in this considering I have more positive feelings towards A rather than his friend, but I will explain more about this on the defensive side. Either way though, a still must be a little sociopathic to be able to be friends with someone like that. When I explained to him, his friend, I was trying to find out, just trying to understand who A is. I said, like, does he even care? Or is he just like some sociopath? And this is what his friends tell me, okay? I'm going to tell you a story to prove to you that A is a caring and empathic person. When A was dating an ex, us three went out one night and I got a little drunk. And I thought his girlfriend was hitting on me, that she wanted to, you know, hook up. So I made the move on his girlfriend, but I clearly misinterpreted the signs. And A was really upset with me and didn't want to be friends with me anymore. 
I felt really bad about it. And I tried asking for forgiveness, but he refused it. But guess what? After a year and a half, he finally forgave me. And you know what? We've become best friends again. It's like, okay, well, were Aiden and his girlfriend still together when he decided to forgive you? He's like, no, wait, what? Wait, why does that matter? And I was like, because if he wasn't with his girlfriend, that means that he most likely was lonely, which shows that he has a problem forming new friendships. So he went against his own boundary just so he could have a friend. Or things ended badly with his girlfriend, and he probably justified his actions, so it made him feel more validated. So in the end, all my efforts fell, and I thought, wow, this man really does not value anything, which is a very scary thought. But then it finally hit me. If you are in my position and you're trying to figure out what someone values, again, please do not do anything that I do. I'm not recommending that. But if you really want to figure out what someone values, you need to look at what it is a fear. How do they express themselves to make up for that fear? How do they prove their worthiness? And for A, it's his intelligence. He consistently spoke about this in a way that it didn't come off really though as egotistical, or maybe he did, but I didn't really take it that way because I actually found his intelligence very attractive. Now he often stated like he could have any job. I mean, he has four degrees. He was accepted with only a 5% chance in the school. I mean, he could be an astronaut if he wanted to. He values his intelligence so much because it's the one thing that his father is actually threatened by. In fact, he even boasted about the fact that he wanted a relationship with someone that would challenge his intelligence, but of course not someone that would actually exceed it. Now this would make sense to me in the, why he hasn't responded after that last email he sent, because my response to him was not emotional, but logical. I purposely challenged him to a logical debate and he knew it. Now, he had said he had never dated anyone that had emotional intelligence like me and didn't expect that to probably impact his cognitive intelligence. I showcased his ignorance in my response, which would have threatened his sense of superiority. Other than admitting that, he's just going to avoid the challenge altogether. And the interesting dynamic about this is that it actually correlates to the human design profile as it did for my ex. Now, what I mean by this is that A is a 1-3, my ex was a 5-1. Now, anyone that has a line five in their profile usually indicates their reputation is going to be something they value because they are consequences of strangers. Their life depends on what strangers think of them, and it's because they're often looked to as the savior. Now, a one three's major purpose is the master of their trade through studying and experimentation. They are the ultimate scientist and tend to be very intelligent and based in logic. And when that intelligence is threatened, it will make them feel insecure and shameful because that's the non-self-expression of those lines. So for other profiles, let's say like a line two will value their privacy. A line four will value their friendship or network. The line six will value their integrity. A line three most value will value their experience. Or they might even value financial because line three is tied to a material gain as well. But as I said, sociopaths have to feel like they will lose what they value if they want to motivate change. I mean, the only way that A is going to lose his intelligence is if something happens to his brain, like that causes significant brain damage. And I'm sorry, but that's far beyond my wheelhouse. And nor would I ever want that for him. And the irony in this, though, that it flips back to that other fear that drives him. You know, he mistreats and dismisses me because I threaten his intelligence. And his father does the same thing to him, which clearly shows that fear alone is not a motivator for these traits. Now, the funny thing about him doing this is actually showing how ignorant he is being because I'm not smarter than him. I would say we're probably on the same level, but our intelligence is expressed in different ways. In fact, it's complementary in a way that combining our intelligence would make us a very powerful couple with the opportunity to learn from each other, which is actually one of the purposes of us meeting. Now, in my closing argument, I'm gonna point out one other factor when determining the level of when someone possesses these traits. I said, you must establish a pattern. It's not that they just treat you this way, but they also treat others. Now, for A, we have his exes, right? We have the coworkers. But I failed to mention in the first lesson in regards to that forum where I found that information about him that it was over 100 women that wrote about him. And I did it, I did purposely leave it out because I didn't want to skew the audience view. And I didn't, because it doesn't really matter to me. It's not how I experienced him. Yes, I understand it's disturbing and like that many people come on. But I didn't look at it as a way to judge him. I looked at it as a way to motivate him to be a better person. Like, do you not see that all these people think this way about you? Like, do you not want to be better? I mean, obviously not, right? So the prosecution rests. So now at this point, if I was to just base the case solely off the prosecution, there is no doubt that A is a sociopath. I mean, everything was a lie and I fell prey to a predator incapable of change. He's getting worse as he gets older and obviously most don't fall for it, unlike myself. I can consider this the truth, and the next time I decide to date, I will pay more attention and not ignore the red flags that were obviously so apparent. I could be happy with the fact that, you know, he's going to live a miserable life and be proud that I got out of the situation before things got really bad. But is there another option? Absolutely. And for moral integrity, the defense has a right to state their case. 
But before I dive into that, I want to emphasize again why closure is so important. Without it, I can assume the worst, right? Moving forward, I will become more hypervigilant and distrustful in relationships, which automatically sets me up for an insecure attachment. This is what happens when communication is refused and people are left in this uncertainty. But hopefully I am here to change that, which is part of the defense. So please allow Ms. Charity to present her case because she claims that we're missing some key evidence, which is ironically supported by my ex. Now, when evaluating the case with my ex, I was trying to convince myself he wasn't a sociopath, but my intuition kept saying he was. Yet with A, I've been trying to convince myself he is a sociopath, but my intuition says he isn't. Now, the biggest defense is that I mentioned how sociopaths are unable to emotionally connect with somebody. They feel at a distance, and I said my ex absolutely did. There was always this barrier between, between us, even next day when I would sit next to him on the couch. I mean, there was always like a little bit of space. He rarely expressed affection. I felt insecure and I doubted myself even in the very beginning when I was just dating him. But as I mentioned in my initial lesson, that was not the case with A. I felt very secure with him. I didn't have any self-doubt, insecurities. I never once questioned how he felt about me. I felt genuine from him. Even with these triggers, it wasn't coldness that I felt. It was this fear that he had. He was very affectionate. And I believe I feel like he had fallen in love with me, which is honestly something I say very humbly. I'm not like, oh my God, obviously you fell in love with me, right? But no, I just, I don't, I felt that from him. But to say that I am wrong on that is to doubt my own empathic abilities, which in the end have always been right. If this is right, it would make sense then to act in a sociopathic trauma response because of his gate 49 being in the top four gates of his design. Now, this is someone that will sabotage the relationship to push a person away the more they develop the feelings. The feelings get stronger, the more sabotage they're going to do. That fear of commitment is so strong with this shadow due to this underlying fear of being rejected. So you can see how this plays out in one of my favorite case studies, Abraham Lincoln. He has the same conscious sun and earth as A, the channel of logic, and he's also an Aquarius sun with a Capricorn moon. Now, Abraham Lincoln and Mary Todd's relationship has ups and downs as well, and they became engaged in 1840, but Lincoln actually broke off their engagement in early 1841, which was a period during which he experienced profound emotional turmoil and doubts about his future, both personally and professionally. This period is often referred to as Lincoln's melancholy. He feared he would be unable to sustain a happy marriage. Now, both Lincoln and Todd reflected on their relationships, and they did end up rekindling their romance, which they ended up getting married in November 4th, 1842. And after their reunion, this breakup, it kind of indicated that they had this deep connection and commitment to each other because they faced so many obstacles, but yet managed to stay together. And ironically, this is kind of the theme with A's and I situation, because according to astrology and human design, the purpose behind A and I meeting is very clear as our connection chart, our synastry, composition, and transit chart at the time of meeting all correlate. But to avoid confirmation bias on this, I actually pulled a horary chart as well that's completely separate from any birth times, right? So just be based on the time I asked the question of what was the purpose of him and I meeting? And it basically said the purpose was meant for us to transform us both towards emotional and spiritual growth. The relationship was meant to come with its challenges that forced transformation towards professional and personal development, bringing some unseen blessings to our life direction. He was supposed to open doors to new understandings and pathways that align with my career and life purpose, encouraging intellectual growth and exploration. For him, the connection with me was to offer this foundation for a deep emotional transformation, providing the stability and perspective needed to navigate significant changes. I was meant to encourage him to take the initiative in his personal growth and emotional healing, balancing his needs with this awareness of how actions and affect those around him. Together, we would offer support and balance, facilitating mutual growth in both tangible and intangible ways. Now, I shared this with A because he claims to believe in predetermination. And to validate it, I also provided it with a prediction for the Super Bowl before it came out because I pulled a horary chart in that as well, which came out exactly how I read it. The only way Kansas City Chiefs would win would be by a last minute transformative play. And I'm assuming you watched the Super Bowl or at least heard about it. Now, while we were dating, I could see the, this actually playing out, right? Because he did showcase indications of change. Despite all the information I found out about him, like he was making those steps towards being this more emotionally aware person. And as I mentioned, like how I felt that emotional connection with him, that did change though after I met his friend. And that was the last time I saw him, which was a little over four months ago. And that changed 12 hours later. Now, if I was to turn to human design for this instance, I would like to present exhibit A, A and B's connection chart. How two people connect and influence each other, this is actually really interesting. So when comparing the two charts, let's 
A's chart, and then we're going to call his friend B's chart, right? Now, A is more defined than B. So you would think that A would be the more influential one between the two. It has more defined centers, and B is more open, right? However, in human design, projectors are meant to guide energetic types. Also, because A is so defined, those undefined centers are prone to conditioning, especially his will center, which is 100% open. Since A is split, we have to look at the hanging gates, especially 8 and 20, that will make A feel whole, giving that person energetic dominance over him, meaning they can be easily influenced by them. Now, when they come together, they're 9 and 0, and they could be cool just hanging out with each other. They don't really need to add more people to their clique. This gives them a way to energetically bounce off one another, exiling any other kind of perspective in their friend group. Looking at these charts, you can see that his friend has two centers that A has undefined, right? So the will center is going to be the most influential because it's 100% open. Now, this center influences your self-worth and self-esteem. So if his friend, who has already showcased high levels of sociopathic and narcissistic traits, usually driven due to self-worth issues, would have happened in childhood, had said anything to A while they were together after meeting me, it would have triggered A into believing he that I was either too good for him or he wasn't good enough for me, triggering that fear of rejection, which also is significant because B has gate 19, which turns on gate 49, that fear of rejection for A. Now, what's really interesting is that according to the gene keys, the 49th shadow is genetically related to the 55th shadow. It states that these two gene keys or gates share the same genetic codon group, which is known as the ring of the whirlwind, which ties them together at some kind of chemical level, which you can see B possesses gate 55. Now, the shadow of 55 is victimization, meaning playing the victim and instead of reflecting on your own role in the situation and removing all self-responsibility for the situation. It's somebody that plays the victim, right? So they're not, it's not their fault. They blame it on everybody else, which can be easily shown like how A did through that email, right? Like this is a classic example of that 55 shadow. And it would make sense considering he did recognize his role when he hurt me at that two month mark, but then that changed all of a sudden, right? Because he didn't take, he didn't put the blame back on me when we had reconnected, but this time he has. In addition, his friend has gate 20, which is that trigger gate, and it connects to gate 10, which is the shadow. This is narcissism. And gate 34, which is rooted in self-absorption and brute power without self-awareness. It manifests as a relentless or trying force making individuals unresponsive to external guidance or intervention. And this is linked to that 43rd shadow, which gate A also has, and is a disconnection from external influences and unawareness of the impact of one's actions. This pretty much reflects what a sociopath is. Everything I just explained is exactly what they, how they describe a sociopath. On top of that, since 34 works with Gates 20 shadow of superficiality, it can create a lack of activity in response to the situation created by your mind. So it's going to ignore and avoid all the situation just because your mind has convinced you that what you must perceive is true. Now, these influences are going to pack how he feels about me and what he thinks about himself in regards to me without him even realizing it on an unconscious level. But consciously, it would project to him as fear. Now, A, of course, should be self-aware enough to be able to step out of that and not be influenced by his friend's shadows. However, it does show an alternative reasoning for his action. So maybe he's not sociopathic at all. Maybe his behavior is not a reflection of who he truly is, but a reflection of the situation surrounding it. And this is something to consider due to the fundamental attribute bias. Western culture often believes that people's behaviors reflects their own personal attributes versus looking at a situation. But now I didn't share this with A because I only looked into it recently. And since A didn't want to meet me and the fact that I gave him plenty of chances to do the right thing, I thought like, what would be even the point, right? And I don't feel like it's going to make that big of an impact in a way. It could come off as an excuse for his behavior instead of him recognizing it on his own. Okay, so why hasn't he changed? And how do I know that, right? Because obviously it shows in his email that he hadn't, but it has been, I think, a little over a month since that since he had sent that. But because if he has changed, I would have heard from him by now. He would have taken accountability as he knows how much this impacts me. He would have felt a moral obligation to stand by his word and provide me with truth. People who claim to change but still refuse accountability have not truly changed. I also realized that A may be refusing to change due to the gate nine's shadow. Now, the gate nine is this inner reluctance on the repressed side to manifest as seeming this inability to do anything about our situation, despite the fact that we do understand it and can see the way out, right? It's this reluctance to move out of one's patterns. Is It's not that it's a conscious choice, but it's essentially a paralysis of our will brought on by following similar familiar patterns that do not serve us. And to break out of that is to leave this safety zone and move us directly into our fears. And But it can be really frustrating, as it states, to onlookers, for someone like me, that see these people are unable to break their patterns 
but it's just as frustrating for those that are actually in this deep seated fear. Ultimately, it comes down to the power of human will to either break through or fall into this continual miserable decline. That's how it states it in the shadow. I can understand how scary it can be, but at this point, if this doesn't get you out of it, what will it take? And then we have to take into consider awareness, right? If he claims that his biggest fear is turning to his father and now he's acting this way, which clearly is proven that he's being just like him, how does that not motivate change, like I said? Well, there's something called the interpersonal repetition syndrome in academic literature, and this closely relates to several well-researched phenomena that describes how individuals often unconsciously replicate patterns and behaviors observed in their relationships, particularly those from childhood. This can include mimicking the dynamics they experience from their primary caregivers. One of the foundational theories related to this idea is that the cycle of abuse where victims of abuse might unconsciously continue the cycle by adopting abusive behaviors themselves, despite their best intentions to avoid such outcomes. Psychological defense mechanisms can prevent individuals from fully acknowledging their behavior or the similarity due to the person they do not wish to be. Cognitive dissonance is when individuals recognize they've become like someone they've disdained and the discomfort of acknowledging this and the fear of change can lead to rationalization and continue maladaptive behavior. The emotional pain and vulnerability of acknowledging one's flaws, especially that mirrors a disliked parent, can be daunting and it leads to this resistance acknowledging against acknowledging or addressing these issues. Then we could also be dealing with the fear that taking responsibility may lead to rejection, right? Like, so taking the fact that A had said like, oh, how he changed and confessed all these issues to his ex and she rejected him. I imagine that has to be very painful to expose vulnerability and not get the desired outcome. On top of that, he did the same with his father who basically shamed him for doing so and refused to acknowledge how he treats him as well. Now, these are very two important people that were part of his life for a very long time, of course, despite how the relationship panned out, it held value to him. So to risk it and doing it again, only for me to possibly come back and say, well, so sad, too bad, could shatter any growth or desire to want to change. He has come up with some kind of story that's convinced him it's not worth the risk. What if all that has just transpired was meant for some bigger purpose? What if what happened has nothing to do with him, but strictly with me and perhaps Pluto? Now, Pluto represents transformation, death, rebirth, darkness, manipulation, abuse, and trauma. And rightfully so. I mean, think about it, right? He's been hanging out in the solar system for years, waiting for his day to be recognized, which was 84 years after Neptune. Finally gets recognized, and then he gets demoted to a dwarf planet because he hangs out with a different crowd that some astronomers don't approve of. I mean, that's so human of us, right? Anyways, I try to give mad respect to Pluto because he's one of my ruling planets as Scorpio being my rising sign, and he also rules that eighth house that I said I'm dominant in. So when I see him playing a role in my chart, I know I kind of have to strap in and prepare for some upheavals that he's going to bring. Now, he is responsible for the midlife crisis, which is around 30 to 6 to 40-ish. That is when like your natal Pluto squares your transit Pluto, and this is dubbed the time of upheaval for everybody, not just me, everybody. Enough said, right? But in my investigation about A, I started learning about solar returns, as I mentioned, right? Because I want to send him his. This is a chart that reflects what the year is to bring. It's a birth chart for the year, right? So I focused so much though on learning about eighth that I forgot to look at my own, but it was because it was seven months prior. And I thought, well, maybe I should look at it because maybe it will showcase why I'm at eight in a different way versus all the other charts, right? Like maybe this will be the one that will show something different. Well, you guys, are you ready to have your mind blown? Because I was. So I have some pretty rare aspects for my 42nd year of life. I have a kite, which is super rare, a T-square, and a yod, which is another rare aspect with both other apex planets being conjunction with Venus and Mercury. Now, this yod is specific because it's often referred to as the finger of God or the finger of fate, and it kind of points towards a faded karmatic journey that's led to a significant personal growth. With Mercury and Venus retrograde conjunct in the eighth house of Leo, which is my sun sign and my dominant house, this is a focus on my inner world. It's specifically related to how I think, communicate, and relate to others on a deep transformative level. It's going to emphasize that this year is going to have these themes of transformation, personal relationships, and values are definitely highlighted. It's requiring me to reevaluate and introspect on these areas more profoundly than usual. And the retrograde motion of both of these planets suggests that I will be revisiting past relationships or there will be some potentially to resolve some unfinished business behind them and to reassess what truly matters to me. Now I have Pluto in the first in Capricorn and Neptune in the third house of Pisces that are forming this space. And that's going to give this layer of intensity and spirituality to the mix, right? Pluto's placement here is suggesting that there's going to be a period of intense transformation and empowerment that is going to be focusing on my identity and how I express myself. 
backed with Neptune in the third house in Pisces enhances my intuition, creativity, and my connection to spirituality. Together, it's kind of like I'm being nudged by the universe to pay attention to my inner voice, to transform, and to align mostly closely with my spiritual and personal truths. It's letting go of old patterns and beliefs and making way for a new one. Now, what's interesting too is that A and I also have a yod in our composition chart. It's our challenge to heal because our that apex planet is Chiron in Taurus in the ninth house through addressing deep-seated issues related to values, resources, and beliefs due to the second and ninth house themes while balancing transformation and responsibility in relationships because it is connected to Saturn and Pluto, which is conjunct in Libra, and interpreting the dreams and spiritual beliefs within the structure of emotions and emotional life, which is Neptune in Sagittarius in the fourth house. So it's just another one of those things that shows this faded connection and how things are meant to be. But back to my own solar chart. Now, the kite in my chart is pretty significant because this is actually showing that this year is meant to build a bridge between who I am and how I connect with the world around me. To give me the strength to deal with challenges leading to personal growth and then a deeper relationship. With Pluto being on one end, it's going to be the, about, again, that giving me this transformation and emphasizes empowerment in my personal identity and how I present myself to the world and to others. It's about becoming the most authentic version of myself, even through every challenge that is presented. With the moon, it's going to be this emotional connection to my dreams, my information and my community and my friendships and these deep emotional bonds that are supposed to be transformative experiences that are turned into collective projects. And then Neptune is going to bring that creativity, intuition, and a bit of mystery to my thinking and communication. It's going to mean that I'm more inclined towards an artistic or spiritual expression. The opposition of the sun being the seventh house of Leo, which is me, of course, adds a bit of tension. It's representing the challenges that are going to require to balance and integrate all of these tools that I've been given. This usually represents that this last stage of development before I step into a higher purpose. Now, where Pluto sits, it's going to force a change so deep and big that it almost will create like an ego death or one's identity to be reborn towards his true self. It's going to catalyze a change within me driven from a relationship. Now, Pluto in the first shows to really gain control over your life. Like you need to understand and work things out that things that you are unconsciously scared of are the things that are holding you back. It's important to face the fears to stop them from limiting your success in interactions with others. Because everybody has certain behaviors or thought patterns that are hard to deal with. And often this is due to past fears and traumas. And Pluto comes in to teach us about that. It's time to tackle those issues head on, learning from past mistakes to break free from what's been holding you back. This is, and this is what's creepy, right? Your past trauma or the current blockage is being activated by a present day situation. Your psychological characteristics tend to be obvious to those in the immediate environment. They will undoubtedly know what sets you off and may use this knowledge to gain power over you. If they love you, they will use this information to help you. But if they're devious, they're going to use it to control you. You need to learn more about yourself and your psychological makeup to deal with self-defeating behavior and to free yourself from bondage to others. Well, what is the present day situation from past traumas? Well, you want to know the last time Pluto was in the almost exact same position as it was in this year's solar return? In 2015, when I met my ex, and in 2019, when I had that very horrible ending with my ex, which makes sense because also opposing, it was also opposing my son and Venus at the time, but they were both in the eighth house, which shows that that relationship was meant to die. So do you think it's a coincidence that I find myself dealing with someone I fell in love with and questioning if they're a sociopath and what to do about it? Because I was in this exact same position the last time. But you see, there is a difference between these situations because it's opposing the sun in the seventh house, not the eighth. And, and Venus is retrograde in the eighth, quincunx to Pluto. Now the sun in the seventh house can indicate a very consuming relationship. One totally compromises your individuality and personal needs. If I was to become passive, refusing to assert myself, the relationship will consume me as I become nothing, which is exactly what happened with my ex. Now, I accept limitations. If I accepted those limitations that are easily imposed upon me, I would grow more insignificant the longer I remained in that type of relationship. My own needs would not be met, and the strain of meeting the needs of others will eventually drain me. I should become aware that if the situation is probably psychologically unhealthy for me and may involve abuse. So if I would have just sucked it up and I'm still letting him treat me however I want, kind of like how I do with my ex, I would have been in the exact same position. The task though, with the sun being the seventh house is to learn to compromise and share within a meaningful and fulfilling relationship. Give willingly without allowing yourself to be used. Now the queen clocks to Venus or to grade indicates that an unresolved issue or pattern from a past relationship is going to resurface, requiring internal adjustments and perhaps a different approach to resolving them. It requires an adaptation and reflection from both parties actually to address these dynamics for the past to work things out and move forward with a more profound and understanding connections. Now, this is the kicker for the Pluto being in the first house. 
right? So it says, and this is what I quote from the book that I got this from, which I think is, uh, I'll put in the notes. But once you have healed yourself and owned your own power, you can give insight to others and influence their behavior also. The psychological power associated with Pluto can be used to heal more than one person. It could be used to for your own healing and of that of others. In the ideal situation, both healing processes occur simultaneously with each individual involved contributing pieces of information leading to wholeness. So not only should this have healed A during this time, right? We should have been doing this simultaneously, but it also allows me to share this wisdom that I provide to you guys to help other people heal as well. So just kind of confirms that channel as well since I started this year. And you know what? I'm so glad I got to go through all of this suffering so I can help you guys. I'm just kidding. I love it. I do. Honestly, I it, this is the reason why I wanted to start this channel. What's random is that this is also confirmed in A's solar return chart because he had actually Pluto in the seventh house for the second year in a row, forming a stellium with a five planet conjunction from the seventh to eighth house. That means that a relationship that would have started in the previous year was meant to inspire transformation regarding intimacy and long-term connections. And if he refuses, well, the universe has a backup plan. And I guess we'll have to see how that plays out. So for now, the defense rests. So where does that leave things, right? I know it was a lot. So I appreciate if everybody got through this point and you know, it's up to you to decide what verdict would you come up with? Well, for myself, ultimately, it's a hung jury because the evidence presented, I do not believe I can conclude beyond a reasonable doubt that A is a true sociopath and quite capable of change. Charity introduced enough plausible alternative explanations to prevent a clear guilty verdict on this charge. And despite that A's behavior is undoubtedly toxic and damaging, his capacity for genuine connection and the unconscious drivers behind his action leaves room for the possibility of growth with, you know, some intensive self-work, even if he's not risen to meet that challenge yet. That said, though, the prosecution also succeeds in proving that regardless of labels, A's past and current conduct reveals a troubling pattern of harmful behavior and inability thus far to take accountability and make amends, despite my efforts to inspire his better nature. Despite the way that fact that fate did play a role in this, it didn't have to play out that way, right? Now, I didn't choose to be abused. I don't deserve because it says that fate that says that you're going to have to go through something I did prior, and this was a repeated pattern. And I chose not to. I did put my foot down on this, right? With my ex, I allowed it to happen. I didn't with him. But it also shows that A did not have to be this way either because it says that he could have supported my growth and process of healing through love, but he chose control. It was dependent on the person. Whichever way it played out, it still plays out. The whole point of it was to make me get through those past trauma and those blockages to make me heal and grow into a better person. And I think, I believe that I have, because in all honesty, I would never have even done this, looked at these things from different perspectives. In the last situation, I would have immediately just gone to the prosecution and that would have been it. There would have been no other situation to look at, right? I know that A will watch this video. He could either do one or two things about it. He can just do nothing and continue living his life the way he does. And that will only prove to me that he is actually sociopathic. Like it does not change how I feel about relationships. It doesn't make me harden. I will just take it as a way to be more aware, consciously aware, but I'm not going to be hyper vigilant. I'm not going to say that no one's capable of change. I did not change my view on that. It's just that some people aren't. If he does choose to want to make amends or realizes like, holy fuck, I really did. I don't want to be this person. Like I will absolutely 100% listen to him. I'm not going to deny that. He could either live his life by statistics and always be living in fear and never know what it feels like to be truly loved. Or he can step up, be courageous. And it's literally up to him. I cannot do anything else about it. I honestly would love for him to change. I would love for him to take that courage step because I do not like seeing a life wasted. I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not going to deny the fact that he hurt me and I'm, and I'm not upset. And, I, and to say that I'm not upset about that would be a lie. I guess I can look at it from a different perspective by saying, well, if that's what it took for me to change and that's what it took for me to grow, then I could be appreciative of that. I can still have hope that this is not the person that he is. And you know what, you guys, if he does, I will fucking appeal this case so quickly and I will let everybody know that. But if he doesn't, I will also let people know that as well. Saying at this point, like I even have closure because I don't. No matter what, again, the whole point of this is that closure is to provide, for me, is truth. And that I cannot make that judgment call without him. The rarity behind all of this, like this is what blows my mind, right? Like to see all this stuff in the charts and astrological connections, a once in a lifetime event. So that means that this was a once in a lifetime connection. There was this beautiful opportunity to grow and to this gorgeous relationship. He claimed that he wanted it and the universe gave it to him. And he, and if he does not change and he does, he kind of kicks that gift horse in the mouth, he will never find another situation like this again. And I can confidently say that because there's no, literally there is no way the planets are going to line up the way they did again because Pluto takes a long time to go around the chart. 
And for myself, like I did the work that I need to do. So I'm not worried about the fact that I'm not going to be able to find another connection. Honestly, it probably won't even matter because for one thing, I may not be here if he chooses to do that. I have to move in 43 days. And with the change comes a change of location. And I will not speak with him after I move because that is a red flag. That's what my ex did. He waited. He wanted to reconnect after I moved and it ended up just being a very toxic and destabilizing situation for me. You know, what's really ironic though, is I don't think that A understands that he actually might have some pretty spiritual gifts that I'm sure his little scientific mind would not be willing to accept. But I do find it a bit peculiar that he had asked me if I would be willing to move to New York City with him in six months. And when he had asked me that, and the time that I am actually moving will be exactly six months. And I am considering New York, but I guess this time it will be without him. And I'm also considering one other place. So we'll see. We can either become victims of our past and our trauma, or we can become survivors. It's up to you to decide. And that you do have free will of. I would encourage you, no matter what though, in this situation, please seek out help. Do not make this decision on your own. You know, I can just say to you, like when I was in that dark time and with my ex, like if I, I went through that alone, I went through that hundred percent alone because I isolated myself to make sure, because I didn't want anybody to see me in pain or ugly or going through these difficult challenges. But you know what? There is beauty within pain. And and there are people that are meant to help you and they will be there for you. You are not alone. I do not know when my next lesson will be posted. Um, I will be obviously very busy, but I will try to at least put up a little less or some human design lessons in between that time. But I promise not to be gone for long. Thanks guys.